Good afternoon. It really is a good afternoon. In fact, it's a fantastic afternoon. This is not a formula. This is truth. I am David uh, Nuremberg, the director of the Institute and the Leon Levy uh, professor here. And I'm pleased to welcome you all to a very special program celebrating the establishment of the Gopal Prasad professorship in recogni and, uh, and recognizing a prolific mathematician, a many time member, a perfect number, six, right? Six time member, a perfect number, yes, of IAS uh, Gopal Prasad who is with us here today. And we're also delighted to be joined by members of the Prasad family, including his wife Indu, children Anup and Ila, grandchildren, siblings, I think it's a small family, about 50, 50 people. But the Prasads have been part of an even larger family, the Institute family, uh, for more than half of its 92 year history, more than half of its history, beginning with Gopal's first membership in the School of Mathematics in 1973. Uh, Gopal's brothers conducted their own research at the Institute. Now, I, this is why I have my cheat sheet, because I don't want to have uh, Pawan Kumar as a member and later a visiting professor in the School of Natural Sciences, as well as Shrawan Kumar and Dipendra Prasad as members of the School of Mathematics. And over the years, not only those spent here, uh, Gopal enjoyed collaborations, discussions with the faculty, including Harish Chandra, Arman Borel, Robert Langlands, Pierre Deligny, Peter Sarnak, and while he pursued his research here on campus, the campus became a kind of second, not a kind of, it became a, not a second home, a home for the family. Anup, Anup Prasad Gopal's son, came to IAS with his parents in 1973, and he spent a year in that most advanced of institutes for advanced study, the Crossroads Nursery School. And then during his father's subsequent visits, Anup and his sister Ila Fiete enjoyed their stays. I say enjoy, I'm sure there were some down days too, uh, 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 at the IS campus while attending Princeton schools. So Anup went on to earn a PhD in theoretical physics from Caltech in 1997, and he's now managing director and head of equities uh, at DE Shaw. He joined the friends of IAS, uh, the formal friends uh, of IAS in 2012. He served on the friends executive committee since 2018. And he has in this uh, yet another way nurtured the family's uh, connections to the Institute. And Ila earned her PhD in physics from Harvard in 2004. A physicist, a computational neuroscientist, she serves as a professor in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at MIT. So the Gopal Prasad professorship is endowed with a gift from the Prasad family, and it ensures that future generations of scholars from all regions of the world will have the opportunity to benefit from the unique environment of discovery at the IAS and their children from the unique environment of discovery of Crossroads. Uh, my child benefited from that. So if I stress it a lot, it's because I know what a magnificent place it is. This endowed professorship is, I think, unique at the Institute uh, because it honors both sides of the Prasad family's engagement with the Institute, mathematics and natural sciences, and it can be occupied by faculty in either school. And that is actually a, a, a wonderful thing for the Institute and for both schools. And um, the mathematics faculty has uh, chosen as its first uh, Gopal Prasad professor, as our first Gopal Prasad professor, Peter Sarnak. I extend my appreciation to Peter, uh, we all do, for putting together this conference and uh, celebrating the impact that Gopal Prasad's work has had on mathematics over the last five decades. And now it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Jim Stone, who will uh, add a few words. So thank you, I'm, I'm Jim Stone. I'm a faculty member here in the School of Natural Sciences. And on behalf of the members and faculty of the school, I just wanted to extend my thanks and appreciation to the Prasad family for this very, very generous gift. Uh, I'm, I'm rather, rather new, new here amongst the faculty, uh, only three years, but it doesn't take very long to really learn what a special place this is. And the obvious ways that this place is special, I think, are the complete freedom you have to pursue ideas and research 
unfettered from, as a faculty member, I wouldn't say any other duty, but perhaps a largely unfettered from other duties. Um, the ability to, to uh, interact with the members, uh, these young people, brilliant young people in all disciplines uh, who are really extremely stimulating and enjoy to work with. Um, and also, of course, the ability to host visitors and to interact with uh, you know, brilliant people from around the world and pursue ideas and research in all of those ways. So those are the sort of things that they're the bread and butter ways that we understand the Institute is a special place. But I think there's another more subtle way and that is the way the Institute kind of builds community and fosters interaction amongst uh, the entire academic community, not just here, but around the world. So it's, the Institute's not just about the people here at the Institute, it's about the general international community of research. Uh, and for me personally, the, the way that connects is through another member of the, uh, the uh, Prasad family. In fact, uh, Pawan Kumar, um, the astrophysicist who I actually met when he was a member here in the 1990s. So Pawan was a member in the 1990s. As was said, he was a visiting professor from 1996 to 2002. He's now a faculty member at the University of Texas, uh, but still comes and interacts with us. In fact, just the past year, he gave a wonderful seminar. And because of COVID, while he couldn't visit in person, he spent the, t the day interacting with people online one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And so that kind of interaction and community, I think, is very unique at the Institute. Um, I met him when he was here in the 1990s. I learned a lot from him about high energy astrophysics and applications to topics I'm interested in. Uh, we continue to, to uh, interact today. And I think that kind of community building, the exchange of ideas and the, way, the ability for uh, academics to get together and to talk is, is another very important and unique aspect of, of the Institute. And so, I think one of the exciting things about this gift is that it's uh, partially designed to improve or to in encourage and promote interactions between members of the School of Mathematical Sciences and the School of Natural Sciences. Again, I, I think this is another uh, interactions between different disciplines is another great aspect of the Institute. So, so again, I just wanted to extend my, my heartfelt gratitude from the school to the members of the Prasad family. Thank you. My name is Nicholas Katz. I work at the uh, place across the road there. So it's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here at the conferring of the first Gopal Prasad professorship on Peter Sarnak. Now Gopal once told me that when he was a student, his father had hoped he would go into business, but that when Gopal was invited to Yale, his father thought, well, maybe mathematics was okay after all. Indeed, Gopal went on to become what mathematicians call a maximal element, meaning someone in whose domain of study there was no one better. And after I get finished, you'll hear three terrific lectures about Gopal's work. The first Gopal Prasad professor, Peter Sarnak, is another maximal element. His 1980 PhD thesis was entitled Prime Geodesic Theorems. These two concepts, prime and geodesics, are themes that run through, through his work. Um, we could describe him as a number theorist, but only if we understand number theory in the widest possible sense. We have to include zeta functions and L functions of all flavors, Riemann, Barton, Hasse, Vey, Selberg, Langlands. We have to include questions of points in varieties with prime number coordinates, functions which take prime values. We have to include monodromy groups, questions of randomness, Ramanujan graphs, expander graphs, questions of ergodicity, equidistribution of all sorts. Now I'm gonna play Leporello to um, Peter's Don Giovanni. He has a prime number of mathematical descendants, 179. He has a prime number of co-authors, 73. In citations, 6,466, so three short of being prime. That'll soon be remedied, I'm sure. And so far, 55 students, so four short here. 
But these numbers barely begin to give an idea of his terrific energy, his generosity with ideas and encouragement, and of, as I know from personal experience, the pleasure it is to collaborate with him. In an interview he gave a few years ago, he said that in chess, he thought he had peaked at age 16. In mathematics, the peak is yet to come. Thank you. Well, thanks, Nick, for very kind words. If, if one third of that is true, I'll be very proud and happy. Uh, so since I'm the first speaker from the School of Math, uh, so let me sound a bit half of the School of Mathematics, uh, how, uh, to add our sincere gratitude to Anup Prasad, who with his generous gift to the Institute made the Gopal Prasad professorship available to both the School of Mathematics and to the School of Natural Sciences. Gopal's many visits as a member to the Institute have been very productive from all angles. Besides his striking research achievements in collaborations with faculty and members, he has had a long lasting impact on us, all of us actually, through his mathematical expertise, which runs very deep, his very clear and beautiful lectures and his generosity with his ideas when talking to him and others, and of course his mentorship. So I'm extremely honored and proud to be associated with the Gopal family in this way. Thank you. Now I will say a few words. Uh, so what we're gonna do is uh, Akshay and I will share this 45 minute period and discuss uh, some of Gopal's works that we've encountered and then the professionals will come after us who know Gopal's works much more deeply. Um, I will uh, discuss three of Gopal's papers, but in order to do that, let me start with Carl Ludwig Ziegel, who I think was a member at the Institute here. I guess I didn't put a microphone. I have a loud voice, so I can shout, but maybe I'll just stick here. Uh, the question is whether my eyesight or my hearing is worse. So yeah, <laughs> so I can't read there. I can read there. And if I go there, I can't hear. So I'll have to somehow. Um, so Ziegel in 1934 wrote this uh, quite remarkable uh, uh, paper about what's called the Ziegel mass formula. He says it's remarkable that in the 20th century, mathematician, a mathematician might still be writing about quadratic forms and have something new to say. But he says, maybe there's something new. And this is an extremely influential paper. And I want to explain Gopal's work and its relation to this amazing formula of Ziegel. So if you take a quadratic form, X transpose AX, where A is an integral symmetric matrix. So it's an integral quadratic form in N variables. Ziegel was interested in trying to solve the equation X transpose AX equals B. So A and B are given. A is N by N symmetric integral matrix and B is a M by M, M less than N symmetric matrix. And X is uh, of the right size, so that, ma that makes sense. And you try to find solutions in, the integ in integers. So this uh, is a, quadratic forms of the integers are highly non-trivial, as he remarked, in the, even in the 20th century. And his mass formula is a remarkable local to global principle, which gives a weighted sum of the number of global solutions, that is the integer solutions on the left-hand side of this equation, in terms of local data. But there's a little rub, and this rub is what I'm going to explain is related to Prasad's work. And that rub is that you can't just look at A, you have to look at all the forms which look like A locally, what's called the genus of A. So you have to sum, and it's a weighted sum or a mass sum, over the genus of the number of global solutions on the left, that is equal to a product, as you can see, of local masses, delta V, A, B, product of all localizations of all primes, P and infinity, if the field is of rationals. And that product of local masses is, in the case of quadratic forms, not so difficult to compute. We will see much more generally that that's hard to compute, and that is one of, one of the things of Gopal that I want to explain. So this is a local to global principle in a slightly cheating form in that you have to average on the left over the genus. It's a remarkable formula. It's proved elementarily in this book. It's, he, he actually describes Ziegel as 
the largest completion of the sum of squares that any person did in, in the setting of matrices. He then gave many other proofs, as did many other people. Um, the local product is given by special values of L functions, bringing that into the four in terms of when you want to apply it. And he highlights, Ziegel, a very important case when it's actually a truly local to global principle, and that is when this genus has only one member in the class, or the class number is one. In that case, you don't have to average over the genus, and you really get an integral global, local to global principle, which is very desirable. But he points out that if the form is definite, positive definite over the reals, then the class number being one is extremely rare. And these rare things are what we love. And in fact, uh, much of the subject began on, with these rare situations where the class number is one. So for example, the sum of two squares, that's got class number one, and that's why Fermat was able to understand it. And the sum of three squares is due to Gauss, which is one of the things he felt was his greatest achievement in his Disquestionius. And that's got class number one, as Gauss showed. And the sum of four squares, Jacobi analyzed, and maybe Lagrange as well. But they're only finitely many with class number one if you are positive definite. So the positive definite makes a tremendous tension. And what's very beautiful when it's positive definite is there are only finitely many solutions to X transpose AX equals B. So you've, it's all elementary and you count the number of solutions, but you're going to have to have something very rare happen. And Ziegel points that out. Enter Tamagawa, who uh, recasts all of Ziegel's formulae in this very beautiful and clean self-normalizing way. He computes the volume of the Adel group. I think the word Adel was introduced by Vey, as we will see in a second. He computes the volume of the Adelic points of the orthogonal group of the quadratic form F, SOF, that's G, as this volume GA over GQ. And this, it's self-normalizing because of the product formula, because you take a top volume form, which is defined over the rationals or over the underlying number field, and this self-normalizing formula gives a very beautiful answer for this volume. It's equal to two. The Tamagawa number of an orthogonal group in three or more variables is equal to two. And he points out that you can recover all of Ziegel's formulae from this together with the Hasse principle. As Gopal also always points out, you do need to have the Hasse principle to begin with. And they, uh, who named these Tamagawa numbers, uh, recognizing the importance of this number two, recognized that, well, if you simply connect it, the Tamagawa number should be one. And he conjectured that the Tamagawa number of a simply connected semi-simple group defined over a number field is always one. Uh, I like to joke here that Vey was always trying to catch up or one up on Ziegel. So he went from two to one, <laughs> the Tamagawa number is one. This is a great uh, achievement that we know the answer. The Tamagawa number is always one. Langlands first established this in the case that the group is split using his theory of Eisenstein series. And then his student Lai did it in the quasi split case. But the inner forms, the compact case, is always the hardest. And that is a tremendous achievement from the trace formula by Kotwitz, who stabilized the trace formula before the fundamental lemma and was able to prove, as a consequence, that for all number fields, the Tamagawa number is one. You do need the Hasse principle. For groups like E8, this is highly non-trivial. In the function field, which Gopal had worked on strong approximation and, so, uh, and harder, the Eisenstein series works very well, but I don't know that it was ever uh, looked at in terms of the trace formula, but uh, it's quite remarkable that Gates, Gori, and Lurie gave a proof that the Tamagawa number is one in the function field, giving an entirely different approach, purely topological approach. So we do know that Tamagawa number is always one. And now we can turn to Gopal, who in the 70s and 80s, uh, we heard that his first visit to the Institute was in the 70s. In the 70s and 80s, Gopal had made uh, striking advances in the theory of arithmetic groups from the theory of st um, strong rigidity, generalizing, uh, completing uh, the many difficult cases after Mostow and strong approximation for simply connected semi-simple uh, groups, even other function fields. So he was kind of primed to uh, tackle the problem I'm about to describe. 
And one of the things that he championed, and uh, actually and I were talking about yesterday, one of the things that he really loves are Bruja Tietz buildings where he, as Nick says, was, is an absolutely maximal element. And there are many maximal elements in that theory, uh, but he's maybe the, the maximal. So in this remarkable paper called Volumes of S Arithmetic Quotients of Semi-Simple Groups, it's publication IHS 1989, written here, I think at least in part at the Institute and dedicated to the memory of Harishandra, Gopal computes the volumes of S arithmetic groups. So he undoes the, undoes the Tamagawa number, which is self-normalizing and very clean and puts a volume which he carefully chooses at each place. There's a normalization with the Parahori subgroup, with the Iwahori subgroups at the finite places and the infinite place according to the paper, maybe a suggestion of Pierre that you normalize the compact, quotient, the compact subgroup in the symmetric space to be one. Anyway, that's a normalization. And then you have undone this self-normalization and there's serious content to this and you can compute the volumes of all S, S arithmetic groups. And Gopal goes to give an explicit, what I would call user-friendly formula. Everybody has used it since, and it's used daily. It's a fundamental fact, uh, including the fact that the product is given by special values of L functions in the region of convergence. This is before Bert Schwinnett and Dyer uh, that Ziegel did this work. So these are, in that sense, a little friendlier. But given that it's in terms of zeta functions, you can start to make estimates and prove finiteness theorems, and this immediately happened. So this is a very basic and important uh, paper of Gopal. I'll call it the Gopal uh, mass formula. It's uh, um, um, the volume of S arithmetic groups. Immediately in the same journal, and Gopal can correct me if it was also written in this paper at the, at the Institute, probably with Borel, uh, maybe I don't know exactly whether you did that and then Borel came and said you could, yeah, but I don't know the history of how it came about, but there are these two very important finiteness theorems. The one is that uh, once you fix the type GS and you go through all arithmetic groups lambda, the set of arithmetic groups whose volume, and you allow any number fields, this goes over all number fields, the set of arithmetic groups whose volume is less than a fixed number, the volume in the normalization I mentioned earlier, is finite. This is a remarkable thing about arithmetic groups, and it's used, and people count arithmetic groups, they look for the smallest volume arithmetic group, and they return and highlight this feature that Siegel had pointed out, that when you definite, when at infinity the group is compact, then the class number really does not want to be small. And so the number of, so the class number in general is this double coset here called CP from his paper. The cardinality of these double cosets with these parahoric subgroups on the left at all but finitely many places, you choose finite places S. And uh, I guess, uh, do you put GK on the left or the right? It probably has changed in recent years. So that's what happens, I think, when you go from when you age, you go from, some people go from left to right, some people go from right to left. Um, anyway, this class number is going to go to infinity outside of a finite set. So there are only finitely many such mir miraculous, especially class number one, they are very, very rare if you are compact at infinity. This is something they highlight, and that's what I want to discuss next. So class number one quotients are very special objects. So class number one goes together with the fact that the group, say it's the group is operating on a building, on a Brewer-Titz building, you might hope that could it act simply, could it act transitively on the vertices of the building? Could it act transitively on the chambers of the building? Well, if you're coming from a compact and infinity group and it's S arithmetic at one place where all the action's taking place, there, is going to be very difficult to act transitively. And every time it does act transitively, it's extremely precious, just like the sum of two squares was. So these are very precious things when you have transitive actions. And this all can be deduced from Prasad's formula very easily. But just exactly which guys are class number one, that is a much harder problem because you have to list them all. I just want to point out that such actions which are transitive on the, on the building, on, on chambers, and on vertices of special type are extremely useful combinatorial objects. So for example, Cayley, Ramanujan graphs that 
Lubotsky, Phillips, and I found were completely based on the fact that there's a class number one group acting simply transitively on the vertices of a Bruha Tietz tree. Uh, later, Lubotsky, Samuels, and Vishne found Bruha Tietz Ramanujan buildings, but you can't do that with compact at infinity because Prasad will prevent you, but you could go to the function field and make those where Cart, uh, I think, uh, Cartwright and Steiger have examples. Uh, the, but in quantum computing, you need to actually make unitary transformations. This is how you build universal quantum gates. And so you have to be compact at infinity. And the so-called Clifford and T gates, which are universal for SU2, PU2, which are actually used by the IBM quantum computer. And even today in nature, you will look that people have built uh, physically an 8-bit Clifford and T group. The Clifford and T group is an S arithmetic group, which your theorem allows, but there are very few of them. So they're quite remarkable. Clifford and T was invented by engineers. It was only later recognized to be S arithmetic, uh, the actual people who re uh, recognized, not in the language of S arithmetic, but just in terms of multiplying two by two matrices ingeniously, are Kalashnikov, Mos Maslov, and Moska in 2013. Parzanchevsky and I found that there's actually a better universal gate set, more efficient, that uses the klein arcosahedral group together with, so a finite group will not give you a quantum computer because it only have uh, finitely many states. You have to get dense in the unitary group. And so you have to add something to the finite, say our finite group of order 60. And we found that you could add an involution which is actually optimal and universal, maybe it will make it to a quantum computer. And Parzanchevsky and um, Evra have made uh, examples that are allowable by Prasad in PU3, but by PU8, Prasad's formula will say you can never find such simply transitive action. So uh, these examples exist just to get around you, <laughs> but they are precious. I want to, uh, in my, I'm supposed to take about 20 minutes. I want to actually spend some time on, I think, one of, I believe this is one of your favorite theorems, fake projective planes. It's an application of Prasad's formula to solve an absolutely beautiful problem, classical problem in algebraic geometry of surfaces. And uh, it was solved by a number of works that I'll explain now, but a key paper is by Gopal and Ewing from 2007. So let me explain this because again, it's fighting exactly this volume and where um, the Prasad formula says there are gonna be very few. And in fact, this is a case where you try to find them all. So I suppose I ask as Mumford did, if there are surfaces, compact surfaces, which are topologic, which have the same Betty number as the projective plane, but are not the projective plane by holomorphically. So you might think maybe none such exist, but Mumford found a construction using Piatic uniformization. He found an example, and he was able to show using deformation theory that there are only finitely many such examples. But if you try to put such arguments together to give a bound of how many there are, you'll get something like, I think uh, Yuang wrote it down, 10 to the five, uh, some very, very, Five, how much? 10 to the five million. Okay, 10 to the five million. That's a big number. <laughs> it's a maximum number. <laughs> that means, uh, at, so at that point, maybe mankind would feel a little despondent about actually finding all fake projective planes, but they find hardly many of them. Uh, what's beautiful about this problem is what goes into its solution. So, work by uh, Yao and Oban on the Kalabi conjecture allowed you to find kalabi yau matrix. And from that, you could show that if there is a fake projective plane that satisfies the Miyoka yau inequality, it would have to be the quotient of PU21. It would have to be the quotient of the unit ball by a discrete subgroup, torsion-free with compact quotient, which is quite remarkable. Already you've got, you've uniformized such a thing. But there's nothing arithmetic, and we don't know about arithmetic features that are automatic. In they aren't automatic. There's a master Deline, for example. Not every lattice in SPU21 is arithmetic. 
So a further rigidity theorem, and this time, and the proof that starts with Kevin Corlett, a quite remarkable proof of the rigidity theorems of Margulis, which are proved using nonlinear harmonic maps, really uh, striking achievement by Corlett, which was then developed in the image in Bruhatit building by Shane and Bromoff, was used by Klingler and separately by Ewing, since they were independently done. It's essentially, I looked at both papers, a very similar proof, to show that after a non-trivial analysis that this quotient has to be arithmetic. So now we know if there is a fake projective plane, it's a quotient of PU21 by an arithmetic group. And moreover, because we know it's Betty's numbers, the Euler characteristic must be three because that's the Euler characteristic of P2. So the Euler characteristic is very close to uh, Prasad's volume formula. And now we're in the position where we can try actually maybe list them. And that's the project they took on and ingeniously with uh, estimates for discriminants, Zeta K at two, his work of Ziegel about estimating the Zeta functions at two. It turns out that these arithmetic quotients that can be fake projective planes were already predicted by Rogowski in his work on the trace formula. They division algebras of type two, of involution of type two, and they uh, are defined in terms of number fields and the number fields are limited by Prasad's formula. And when you make estimates and they work very hard from tables of bounds for discriminants and things like this, and as I said, bounds for special values, they come up with 18 potential arithmetic groups in which these 18 uh, potential uh, fake projective planes lying as low index subgroups inside these. And they actually show there are many more than people thought there were before. But within those, they don't, there are three that they didn't know whether amongst them they are fake projective planes or not. And for that, the computer has to be used much more seriously. And this is, was done by Cartwright and Steiger, who looked through these 18 and determined by writing generators and relations and computing the torsion homology, not just the Betty numbers, determined all of the fake projective planes. And there's a very beautiful round number for the answer. There are exactly 100 of them up to by holomorphism. Exactly 100 fake projective planes. And that uh, is quite an achievement. If you look, it's kind of nonlinear harmonic maps, differential geometry, algebraic geometry, and you see the effectiveness of the mass formula in action through Prasad's formula. I find this to be quite striking. Um, just so you, in case you might think that Gopal, who's 70 something, is slowing down, no signs of that. He's got a book he just sent me a few weeks ago that's called Bruha Tits Theory, which confirms his love of Bruha Tits Theory, a new approach. And they have uh, discussed an approach which avoids integral models, if I understand correctly from the introduction, and uses much more root datum in the description. And this is coming soon, if I understand, in Cambridge University Press. And uh, you young in July, okay, and you youngsters who see, who, you know, papers on the archive. Now, this is a book and it's 800 pages. And it's beautifully written, I assure you, even though I've only read the introduction. So, Gopal, uh, let me congratulate you and let me hand over to my colleague, Akshay uh, Venkatesh. Uh, Thanks. Okay, thank you, everyone. It's really nice to uh, have this chance to give a talk in honor of Gopal. I first met Gopal when I was a graduate student visiting Michigan in uh, around 2002, 2001. And uh, I remember how kind he was to me then. He's been kind to me and many other young mathematicians ever since. Um, so what I want to talk about today is, a, I think, a very in, a nice theme of uh, the that occurred many times in mathematics in the latter half of the 20th century, which is the interaction between the theory of dynamical systems and algebra. Okay, and this is something which uh, I think it, it gives a thread through Gopal's work. I, I have very little time, so I'm only going to mention two of Gopal's papers, but it's, a, a, I think, one of the themes you can see in his work. So when I say uh, dynamics or dynamical systems, this is uh, mathematical 
theory that was evolved to model the time, long time evolution of physical systems. Think, for example, what will happen in the solar system over billions of years. Uh, another one of the people who contributed to its origins was Ludwig Boltzmann in the 19th century, who was studying the kinetic theory of gases. And he formulated a concept which has been very important in this mathematical story, which is the ergodic hypothesis, which is in the context of um, you know, gases, the idea that um, if we consider the, all the molecules of air in this room, they're going around, they're bouncing off each other and so on. Over a long time, that system will pass through every configuration which is physically permissible to it, okay? So there'll be a time when all the air is on the left side, there'll be a time when all the air is on the right side, that's if we're not there at that time, but, um, and of course this is over very long time scale, billions of years. So the mathematical formalization of this theory is we have a space X and uh, like say a topological space and some transformation from X to X depending on time, which tells you how the system evolves over if you allow a time t to pass. So I'll call that g sub, uh, g sub t from x to x. So in the previous example, x would be this uh, space which keeps track of all the positions and all the velocities of all the molecules in this room. So it's a very, um, it can be a very complicated space. And this ergodic hypothesis, it's, it, its mathematical formulation is that the, if you take a point, I, I, so in this talk, I'm not going to be very precise. I won't distinguish between ergodicity and unique ergodicity. Essentially, it says if you take a point of X and you watch its trajectory, that is, you apply this G sub T and it, it goes around and around, that eventually that fills out the whole space, that it becomes dense. That's the mathematical formulation of the ergodic hypothesis. Now, there's an interesting class of examples mathematically uh, very interesting and they're good to test any general idea you have about dynamical systems where the time evolution will come by multiplication by an element of a group okay so your uh, the, the important feature of this is is that some group involved the, the space x will be a coset space for a group g such as uh, occurred in peter's talk and there will be an element of the group that tells you how to evolve by time t. Okay, so this co an element of this coset space represents the space of the system, and this element g sub t tells you if you multiply by g sub t, it tells you where you are after time t. So there are here are some examples. You could take g to be two by two matrices of determinant one. So I, so I'm not writing down. There's some coset space for this which is involved, which will always have bulk finite volume. Uh, here are two examples of matrices that you can use as um, models for time evolution. So these are simple dynamical systems uh, and they are uh, I've given some algebraic description, but they model things that arise also in geometry. The G stands for geodesic and, uh, and H stands for horocycle. They model the geodesic and horocycle flow on surfaces of constant negative curvature. Okay, so I, I, I'm coming in a moment to, to Gopal's work, but let me first say that one of the um, most important, so uh, these ideas originated in physics and, and slowly there were uh, people trying to develop a mathematical theory of these systems. And one of the most important early papers is a paper of Hopf from the 19, of 1939, where he introduces what people now call the Hopf argument. And the basis of this argument is, um, you know, something which is quite familiar to us is that you can have a system with two very close, um, two, you, you started in two very close points, but after a while, the, the, their trajectories diverge. Okay, the system has very sensitive dependence to where you start. Uh, now, if you look at that in terms of, uh, and reverse time, it has a, is a less familiar situation or kind of strange where you have something with a system in two different states. And as you move forward in time, the, um, those two very different states converge to the same thing. Anyway, Hopf realized that you could exploit 
in, there are certain classes of dynamical systems where you can really exploit the features of trajectories converging together or diverging apart. They're called expansion and contraction. And he used it to prove the ergodicity of the geodesic flow on a manifold of, of negative curvature. This was really opened a whole um, new field of ergodic theory. Now, in terms of the notation of the previous slide, he shows that the, oops, the flow, the, this multiplication sub G sub T is ergodic using this fact, which you can, okay, you don't need to remember what the symbols are. This is just something which comes out of matrix multiplication. Um, but what it says is that it gives you families of trajectories for this G flow, which all come together and other families that all expand. So now this is Hopf in 1939, something which has been very surprising. Peter referred to this paper of Gopal from 1977, strong approximation for semi-simple groups over function fields. I won't say what the, what this paper is about, but whatever it is, it, it is about algebra, okay? It's about discrete objects. There's no real numbers. There's nothing continuous. There's no time. It's about discrete objects. For, uh, and so it's an amazing thing that in this paper, this very argument of Hopf appears. So I'll show you where it is. This is Prasad's um, 1977 paper. So this is exactly Hopf's argument deployed in a different setting and in the service of a very different goal, but it's showing this er ergodic hypothesis by using, as you see here, contracting and expanding directions. It's a very remarkable thing. Just, I, I think that something which was developed in this context of long time evolution, continuous times could be possibly applied to algebra and discrete systems. This is not the only many interesting things in this paper, which really solved a fundamental problem, but this is one that I find very striking. And it's, it's uh, that dynamic, dynamical systems could interact with algebra. And uh, Brian Conrad, is Brian here? There he is, is going to uh, explain uh, other manifestations of this in Gopal's work. Okay, now, I, so, so far I talked about, um, uh, I've given you just one example, but it's uh, I think part of a larger class of examples where ideas from dynamical systems were able to, were used for algebraic purposes. Um, now I want to say a little bit about it's a two-way street. So ideas from algebra have also helped in um, dynamical systems. So uh, I mentioned earlier the geodesic flow and the horocycle flow. So horocycle flows are uh, they are the space X is a coset space for some Lie group, and then you the flow comes from multiplication by some um, unipotent element a matrix, all of whose eigenvalues are one. And here, the fundamental conjecture was formulated by, by Ravanathan, who's Prasad's advisor in the 90, early 70s, um, uh, late 70s. The, so it is not true that all the orb trajectories of a horocycle flow are dense. Okay, it's not true. What Ravanathan said is that the exceptions to that can be exactly classified. The only, if it's not dense, then what it happens is it wraps, a, it fills out the orbit of a closed subgroup of G. So the, what this says in qualitative terms is that the dynamics of this problem is entirely controlled by purely algebraic data. That is the structure of the closed subgroups of G. This is a, now this is a very important conjecture, not you know, from the point of general point of view of dynamical systems is some very special thing, but it has many applications. Okay, it was like, it, it's, a, uh, it's an interesting test example and has many applications. It was proved by um, Marina Rackner after many contributions from many authors, including a, a, a paper of uh, Borel and Prasad. Okay, so this is already, there, there's some, uh, uh, sense in which the, the dynamics is controlled by algebra, uh, but I want to go a little bit further. So this is the statement of, um, of this uh, 
conjecture of Raghunathan proved by Ratner that the closure of any, that this should say trajectory, any horocycle trajectory on a homogeneous space is the orbit of a closed subgroup. That statement is very satisfactory, except for the fact that there are a lot of closed subgroups and potentially many possibilities. Okay, so it, it looks like a clean statement, uh, but when you want to apply it, you realize that the set of exceptional, the, it classifies things, but it classifies in terms of something that's itself rather complicated. So the, the possibilities for these orbit closures are of the same type as this G mod gamma, but living inside a smaller group. They're coset spaces for smaller subgroups. And in problems of this type, when you apply these theorems, you need to understand uh, the, the worst case is if this orbit is in some sense small. Okay, that is, if you're trying to show that some trajectory fills out a space, the worst possible thing is it, if it, it's trapped for all time in some small subset. So this is a, a problem of exactly the same nature as Peter talked about. Okay, it's a problem of the same nature as classifying quotients of class number one, of classifying small volume quotients of, um, of, of Lie groups, okay? And uh, so, for example, the, the, the reason I've um, noticed is it came up as a central problem in a long paper I wrote with Ein Siedler, Margulis, and Mohammadi about concerning dynamics. And we solved it again with Prasad's volume formula. Okay, so let, let me show you the volume formula. It was referred to by Peter, but here's Prasad's paper. This is the formula, which you can we can pause to admire. Um, okay, the, the, what, what is, this is a volume. It's a, it's a formula for a volume. It has a bunch of stuff on the right-hand side. The, the, one part of it is something which one, uh, it, this uh, thing involving pi has to do with the volumes of odd dimensional spheres. Okay. Everything else is of algebraic nature. Okay, all these, all these things are, are, it, um, they come out of algebra and algebraic geometry and group theory. As, as Peter said, the, uh, part of the beauty of this formula, it uses the theory of buildings for piadic groups, um, uh, so, uh, which is a recurring theme of Gopal's work. So it's really a, a formula of, um, this, this paper is some very beautiful piece of algebra. I should say, by the way, you know, Gopal's expertise on this has been a, a, a a resource for everyone for, for so long. You know, it, it, um, it's many times happened to me. Some maybe a student would come and ask me a question. I would try to solve it. About suppose they asked, they would ask me a question about buildings for periodic groups. I would try to solve it. I couldn't. Then I would go and ask Brian Conrad, and then Brian would try to solve it. And sometimes he could. And then if he couldn't, then it would go to Gopal. And then either the answer would come down, or it would be said if it can't be solved, and then this would be relayed down the chain to this uh, student. But anyway, as it's been said, I mean, Gopal has been a tremendous resource. These are very technical things and we've had a big influence simply through the fact that uh, being a resource of the whole community about uh, this type of theory, the attic groups. Okay, so now this is Prasad's volume formula. And as I said, it's, it's really a, it's a tour de force of algebra. There's no, uh, there's nothing in it about analysis or dynamics, but it comes up naturally when you study dynamics on uh, uh, the, these horocycle orbits for the reason I said, it helps you control what are the small exceptional cases that occurs there. And it's found many other applications. Okay. so. Uh, this is all I, I had to say. I, I, I kept this very brief. I think that I only talked about two papers of Prasad, but I think the themes I said really um, are present in a lot of his work. And the very beautiful idea that I think which is not exhausted that there's a interaction between dynamical systems and algebra. So, uh, well, I'm a little bit early, so maybe I could, uh, I, I, let me stop there, but also if anybody has questions either for me or Peter, you can ask before I hand over to the next speaker. Which 
this is a kind of stunning. So if you uh, don't ask for fake projected planes with a Betty numbers, the fake projected planes with singular uh, homology. So is there a fake project, project is there something that looks like a <coughs> singular homology? It is not viable to do so. The answer is no. That's a consequence of their work. So singular homology does determine that is tremendously clean, beautiful. So and I don't think it has an easy tool to put out all those tools as well. But, um, um, sorry to disturb you, but I just want to do this complete my lecture. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's a great honor for me to speak here on this occasion. Uh, and I would like to thank the organizers for this opportunity. Uh, we have known Kapal Prasad and his family for more than 30 years. And over that time, I was very fortunate to work with him on several research projects. Most of them were in the area of arithmetic theory of algebraic groups. And today in my talk, I would like to give uh, an overview of Gopal's contribution to this area. So Prasad's contribution to the arithmetic theory of algebraic groups includes the following. The proof of strong approximation of a global field of positive characteristics. Investigation of the congruent subgroup problem, and particularly the computation of metaplastic kernels. Nizartit's conjecture, the volume formula for, for S arithmetic quotients, which was mentioned already twice a day, but the third time is a charm. Uh, and with this weekly conventional very student subgroups and their applications to. I suspect a low arithmetic space. Okay, I need to apologize if you will see some overlap to the previous talks, but I think that should be okay. I will just skip certain parts. So I will try to give you a survey of some of those topics, and then I will give you a more detailed account on the last one. Uh, I think this choice defeats the occasion because while, while working on this topic, we received a lot of input from Peter Tarnak, who is the first holder of the Bolgar Strong approximation. So let G be a linear algebraic group defined on a global field K. We fix a set of places of K, always not empty and usually finite. And then we let A of S denote the ring of S and delta of K, which means the adults without the components corresponding to places in S. Then we say that G has strong approximation with respect to S. If the diagonal embedding of the progression of points into the adelic points has dense image. So that's a technical definition, but informally, you should really think about strong approximation as a far reaching generalization of the Chinese remainder theory of two arbitrary algebraic groups. And this is already indicative of the fundamental nature of that property of the theory. Now, proving strong approximation is relatively easy for groups like SLN, namely for k split groups, because then you can use the one-dimensional root subgroups and the strong approximation for the field. However, the problem becomes quite hard if your group does not contain any important elements. In other words, it's an isotope. Various cases of the problem were started by such mathematicians as the Aitash, Mora, Bill, Nizer, now, in 1969, Platonov gave a uniform argument for groups over number fields. Now, the argument used the basic uh, Lee theory, which of course is not available in characteristic E. So, and the solution of the problem was strong approximation of global fields of positive characteristic was obtained independently by Gopal and by Margulis using ergodic theoretic considerations, which were already mentioned in this fashion. Uh, but this happened 15 years later. And this paper of Gopal appeared in the Annals of the My next subtopic is even more classical than strong approximation. It's the congruent sum problem. So this problem was considered by Friquet and Klein for the group SO2Z back in the 19th century in connection with the theory of the orthic forms. 
So more precisely, to every integer n, that corresponds to the congruent subgroup of level n, which is referring to the reduction map mod n, which of course is a normal subgroup of higher integers. So the congruent subgroup problem is the question whether the converse is true. Namely, does every finite index normal subgroup of gamma contain a suitable congruent subgroup? Soon after this question was raised, again, back in the 19th century, so Friquet and Klein observed that, in fact, for SL2C, the answer is no. And that was the end of it for quite some time. But then in 1960s and 70s, it was shown that for some other groups, including, for example, SL3Z and SL2 of Z over with respect to P, the answer to a similar question is yes. And as part of the development, Sir introduced the notion of the congruence kernel that measures deviation from the positive solution. So let me tell you what this congruence kernel is in the cases we have just discussed. For the group SL to Z, the congruence kernel is a huge group. It's a free profiling group of countable rank. That's why the congruence of a program for SL to Z fails in a big way. On the other hand, for groups like SL3Z, the congruence kernel is trivial. However, if you look at, for example, the group SL3 <coughs> or Gaussian integers, it's something in between. The congruence kernel is not trivial, but it's a small sickly group. It's a sickly group of order four. So, and from this perspective, the congruence of a problem becomes a problem of computing. Of computing the congruence. Now, this problem has two aspects. One is proving that in the higher rank situation, C is actually finite, or as we say, central, meaning that it's contained in the center of the corresponding arithmetic completion. And then identifying C precisely, which is equal to another problem, namely the computation of the metaphysic curve. And Gopal's work contributed actually to both aspects. In fact, the metaphysic kernel was computed in all cases that are needed for the congruence of this problem. And without going into technical details, so let me just mention that the answer is basically the following. The metaphysic kernel is either trivial or is the group of roots of unity in the base field. And here I have the list of uh, papers associated with this topic, and I hope that these slides will be posted so people can see and see his 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 topic. Next, volume form. Well, this has already been mentioned, but it should be mentioned many more times because of its importance. So, to put this in context, so one of the results of the classical reduction theory developed by Borrell and Chandra, and we did here is that if we have a semi-simple algebraic group over the rationals, that the quotients of the real points or the integer points has finite power measure. Of course, this can be generalized. And if we can take an arbitrary number field, in fact, an global field, choose a finite set of places and be more affinity places, and then replace the group of real points with the following, which is the product of the group of all computations or all cases S. And then the result, generalizing the result of our Chandra is that if we have any S arithmetic subgroup, then the quotient has finite uh, arbitrage. However, of course, it's one thing to know that the volume is finite, it's a completely different thing to know this volume. And in any situations, it's important to know the volume. Because as Skid explained, it carries very substantial arithmetic information and also the topological information about the the order characteristics of that. And uh, this formula was found by Kopal in his IHS paper, and it might seem a little bit intimidating. So I tell you not to put it on the slide, but let me explain the nature of, of the formula. So it has factors of three kinds. There are factors depending on the field, which is basically the description of the field. 
that are affected depending on the root system. And there are also local factors. There is a kind of well, the product present in the formula. So to explain the nature of local factors, let's consider the classical example. Let's take the group SL2. Now, for this group, we have the explicit fundamental domain, and therefore the volume of the quotient can be uh, computed explicitly. It's actually pi squared over six, which you can also recognize as the data value at two, which has the classical order of representation. So what we see in this example is the local factors are precisely the local factors of some data function. And in the general case, the local factors are products of local factors of some data or, or L functions. And as Peter said, that's very nice because this makes this formula computable and workable. So this formula can be analyzed using number techniques, which has been done by many people. So I listed some names, but this list is obviously incomplete. So these and other people use the formula to obtain very explicit results. For example, they were able to identify lattices of minimal low volume determine the growth of the number of lattices as a function of low volume and for many, many other purposes. However, the most spectacular application of the volume formula was given by Prasad himself in the joint work with Cyclium. And it was a big theorem, and I would say even the theory about paper objective plates. As Peter said, what's a, a fake projective plate? So it's a smooth complex uh, projective surface that is not CP2, but which has the same beta numbers as CP2. Marburg took interest in such uh, <coughs> surfaces, and in fact, in 1971, 79, he constructed the first example of using PAT Now, over the next like 25 years, only three more additional examples were found. At the same time, as, as Peter said, so some general theory of big projects was developed. So there was, first of all, a uniformization theorem saying that a big projective plane uh, is always a local specific space for, for, for the projective people, PU21. And a very important fact is that this group must be arithmetic. So, by and large, the classification of patriotic planes reduces the classification of torsion free lattices in that group with all the characteristic three, which is all the characteristic ones. And again, without going into details, let me say that using volume formula, Prasad and Jung identify all such lattices. And their work immediately produced 28 new families of paper projective plates. Remember, it took like 25 years to, to, to produce three. So now they go immediately to 28. And in fact, so using these techniques and employing computer, Donald Cartwright and Tim Sticker gave a complete list of paper projective plates. So it includes 50 items up to diffeomorphism, and each item has two different forms. And subsequently, Prasad and Sagin were able to analyze big versions of some other projective varieties. Okay. And for details, let me again refer you to the works of Prasad. <laughs> now I come to the you know, next topic, which is quickly conventional logaristic and subgroups. Now, our initial motivation in the project was the famous question asked by uh, Mark Katz in, uh, in his paper. In fact, it was the title of his paper published in the American Mathematical Monthly. Can one hear the shape of a drum? But nowadays, we prefer to think about uh, this work as a new form of rigidity, which we call the eigenvalue rigidity. Again, to put this in context, so let me remind you of what we mean by rigidity statement. 
It's a state of, of the following kind. Suppose we have two semi simple Lie or Lie groups, and in each of them, we have a large sub. <coughs> so it could be could be the commensurator or over lattice or something like that. Then, these statements usually tell us that under appropriate assumptions, uh, every homomorphism uh, or isomorphism between these large subgroups extends to the homomorphism or isomorphism between the ambient and the groups, as shown. This type of, of theorem has the following consequences, which is important for understanding what we are doing. So let's take a very simple example where one of the groups is just a seven Z, where n is at least three. And then let's say the other group is a group of points of some algebraic group uh, over the ring of integers of some algebraic, of some, uh, uh, algebraic number. Then it follows from the rigidity statement <coughs> that if these groups are isomorphic or even very isomorphic, then the field must be two. So the ring must be the ring of integers. And the ambient algebraic group must be isomorphic to the cell M. So thus the structure of a high rank arithmetic group determines two things the field of definition. And the ambient algebraic group as an algebraic group of the Now, of course, this structural approach to rigidity is not applicable to arbitrary realistic and subgroups because these may very well be just three groups. On the other hand, so our work indicates that one should be able to to recover such data as the field of definition and the ambient of the group of the field from any of the that subgroup, if instead of structural information, we use information about the eigenvalues of elements. And we call this phenomenon eigenvalue repeating. But before I can show you uh, some results, we need to discuss some basic issues. Well, how do we match the eigenvalues of elements of two very different subgroups? These may be represented by matrices of different sizes. They will have a different number of eigenvalues. How do we match them? And the second question is, of course, why do we care about the eigenvalues? So, in the next section, I'm going to address this. First, how do we match the eigenvalues of elements of the risk of sub? For this, we gave the definition of weak commensurability, which I'm going to present to you. So let F be a field of characteristic zero. Now, suppose we have two semi-simple meaning diagonalizable matrices, gamma one and gamma two over that field of sizes n1 and n2. And suppose Lambda one through lambda n one and mu one through mu n two are the I are the eigenvalues of those elements computed in the fixed algebraic group. Then we say that gamma one and gamma two are only commensurable if there are integers a one through a n one and b one through b n two, so that this equation holds. Which means that some uh, non trivial multiplicative combination of the eigenvalues of one matrix equals some uh, multiplicative combination of the eigenvalues of the other. That's all we require. Now, suppose we have uh, two reductive algebraic groups, and in each of them, we have a basic answer. We say that gamma one and gamma two are would be commensurable if every semi simple element in one of them of infinite order is weakly commensurable to some semi simple element in the other one of infinite order and vice versa. Of course, you see this definition for the first time, you probably find it weird. Why do we lump together the eigenvalues of? Of, of a matrix. 
Usually what we do is we want to separate them. Here we do the opposite. But this definition was actually dictated by some geometric problems. So let me talk a little bit about that. So let M be a Riemannian manifold. And this top manifold really means a, a symmetric space or local symmetric space. One that associates different sets of data to that situation. For example, if M is compact, we can look at the Laplace spectrum, which is a collection of eigenvalues with multiplicities. Or we can look at L of M, which is a so called weak length spectrum. It, it's just a set of or sequence of all lengths of all low geodesics without multiplicities. Let me also remind you that the big say that two remaining manifolds are commensurable. And then for many years, people have been interested in various forms of the following question. Given two manifolds, that, or let's say even low prismatic spaces, are these manifolds necessarily isometric or commensurable if they have the same aspect, which is that whole isospect, or they have the same length spectrum? Which is that called isolated Or they satisfy the following condition. The set of which I will comment on it later. So the set of all rational particles of the land of all the geodesics in one of them coincide with the set of all rational particles of the land of all the geodesics in the other one. In which case uh, the uh, main forms are called that symmetry. I just want to point out that one is actually so is a formal statement of. That is question about the one that the There are examples uh, of isospectral and isolect spectral manifolds that are not isometric. Here, of course, come on uh, low presenting spaces where they were first constructed by Vinara, who constructed uh, arithmetic limits. And so now that we give a much more general construction that applies to, uh, to, to basically any dimension. Note, however, that both constructions produce commensurable manifolds. Now, I should point out that there are also non commensurable isospectral manifolds that are constructed by the most Yankees co authors. But nevertheless, one expects to prove the commensurability of isospectral. And I suspect to uh, I select spectral manifolds in many situations. I must say that before our work, this was done only for arithmetically defined Riemann surfaces by Alan Reed and we were three manifolds by Alan Reed and his work. Now, in our work, we're able to prove the commensurability of many arithmetically defined I suspect and I select spectral. Spaces and the tool we use is precisely the link between isospectral reality and isolate spectrality and weak commensurability. Now, to give you a bit more details, let's skip some locations. So, let G be an absolutely simple real algebraic group, and G calligraphic will be the group of uh, real points of that group. Now, K will be the maximal compact subgroup of G calligraphic, and X will denote you know, the corresponding symmetric space, which is the portion of G mod K. Now, given a discrete torsion free subgroup, we can divide X by M on the other side, which creates a low prismatic space. And we say that the low prismatic space is arithmetically defined if gamma is arithmetically defined. Now it's known that for local aesthetic spaces, condition one, which was the condition of isospectrality, implies condition two. So I select spectrality. So we just use trace formula. Here's one thing that I would like to point out. So ultimately, we would like to prove the commensurability of our manifolds, but this set of data, uh, the Laplace spectrum and the next spectrum, actually change. If you pass the commensurable manifold. So they're not invariants of the commensurability class. And 
For this reason, we introduce that condition three, which is a, a set of all rational particles of the set of all geodesics in Y uh, equal to the set of all rational particles of the length of all geodesics in the other one. So we call it less permissionability. So this condition is invariant under basic uh, conventional mechanical. So therefore, sometimes people now look at the set of all rational multiples, which is called the rational yeah. 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 In any case, we have the following implications. Isospectral implies isolate spectral, and isolate spectral implies that's conventional. Now, it turns out that the weakest of these conditions, maybe <coughs> condition three, already implies that the fundamental groups gamma one and gamma two are weakly conventional. Here's the statement. So, suppose we have low prismatic spaces of finite volume of absolutely single real logic groups G1 and G2. So, if the corresponding low prismatic spaces are less conventional, then gamma one and gamma two are weakly conventional. Okay, and here is where I need to make one disclosure. So the proof relies on results and conjectures from transcendental number theory. So for rank in, in, in rank one situation, uh, we use the result of the von Schneider. So it's a theorem. So in rank one situation, our uh, results are absolute. So in higher rank situation, they depend on the truth of the Schneider conjecture. So while the results for multi-dimensional subgroups are independent and sort of absolute, their geometric applications in higher rank situation depend on the truth of the shot of Chanel's conjecture. Okay, on the other hand, so the local genetic spaces are commensurable even only if the groups are commensurable up to an assembly. So for geometric applications, we need to know when the split commensurability of subgroups of lattices imply the commensurability. And as we will see in the rest of this talk, this is in fact the case in many uh, situations when the groups are arithmetic. But the remarkable thing is that with commensurability has strong consequences even for arbitrary realistic and so on. This is what I'm going to discuss next. And that's why we only have this concept of okay. So I'm going to discuss next. Here's one result. Okay, suppose we have a field of characteristics zero, and we have two absolutely almost simple algebraic groups. And in each of them, we have a finitely generated aristic ensemble. Then, if the groups are weakly commensurable, then either G1 and G2 have the same type, or maybe one of them is of type PL and the other is of type CL. Okay, the proof is not that difficult, but the result of it is sort of is a bit eye opening because you see this small sample. In principle, can be just the three group of two generators. Okay, can see the lead type of the ambient algebraic group. What we really prove here is that G1 and G2 have the same order of the wild, and then this leads to it. For a risky enough subgroup, we define the so called trace field. It's simply the subfield of F, which is generated by the traces of all elements in the joint representation. Now, there is a theorem of Greenberg that says that this field is actually the minimal field of definition of that gap, meaning that one can choose a basis in the V algebra so that all transformations from that gamma are represented by many pieces of the Then, of course, you can take the risky closure and you get. Uh, and algebraic group, which we call the algebraic cloud. In fact, it's of course k defined because other things are just elements from k. And in fact, it's an f of k form of, of our group that we started with. Of 
Now, this group is actually quite important. If, uh, in fact, if determinants gamma have no commensurability in the respective situation. So we would like to know this group also in the knowledge. So uh, now let me show you another theorem. If our discrete sub, uh, our resident subgroups gamma one and gamma two are not commensurable, then they have the same field of definition. They have the same trace field. Let's see where this puts us. So suppose we have two really commensurable subgroups, then the ambient groups have the same lead type, which means that they are isomorphic over the algebraic closure. At the same time, this theory tells us that these groups have the same field of definition. So the missing element is what can we tell about these groups over the field of definition? And here we would like to offer the following finite conjecture. Again, suppose we have two absolutely simple algebraic groups. In one of them, we fix and finitely generated the risk of the And with a k denote the corresponding trace field. Then the finite conjecture predicts that there are only finitely many forms of the second group so that. If we have a finitely generated Zaristic and subgroup, which is really commensurable to the first one, then it must sit inside one of them. So, simply speaking, this means that only finitely many algebraic groups of type G2 over, over the field K can have potentially contain a Zaristic and subgroup which is really commensurable to this. Okay. In more concrete terms, uh, Let's take a simple simple algebra and let's look at the corresponding projective group. Also, fix our favorite the risky dense subgroup yeah. and that K denote, you know, the, let's suppose that the, the trace field is K itself. Then we find that the trace predicts that there are only finitely many simple simple algebras over K so that the corresponding projective group can contain a, a the next step is about uh, yeah. And of course, we can make similar statements also for orthogonal or spinner group topographic forms and for other types of Now, uh, the final conjecture is known in several cases, let me list some of them. So, first of all, it's known if K is a number field, although the subgroup doesn't have to be a Second, it's known for inner forms of type AL, so in other words, for groups algebras over any finite degree of K. So the example I really had on the previous slide is already a theorem. Now, these two cases actually cover all medicines in real simple groups. Now, the inner case, though, is still work in progress, but I can just mention quickly one. Recent paper written with, with Chernozov and Ingram, so in which we actually show that the finest conjecture for algebraic calls can be reduced to another finest conjecture for algebraic groups with good reduction. Now, the latter is actually related to many other issues, also to the passive principle, to the genus problem, and things like that. So, and for details, I would like to refer to this same article. Now, of course, we have much more precise results for arithmetic groups. Sorry, I'm just something these theorems. Are you assuming Chanuel or not? No. Whenever we talk about putting commensurable groups, we do not assume any results. But our derivative is the primary fully required. In our standard setup, so we have two absolutely almost simple F groups. And in each of them, we have as a risk of this, as a arithmetic subgroup. Then, if the groups are of the same type, which is different from these three types, A, N, D, 2N plus 1, and P6, then if 
they are weak commensurability, implies their commensurability. Let me make a couple of remarks about this exception type. First of all, they are all this exception. Uh, namely, for each of those types, you can construct weakly commensurable subgroups which are not commensurable. And in fact, you can recognize that these types are precisely those three types where negative one is not in the wild group. And this is actually using the construction of, 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 of strong. Now, in any case, uh, if you fix one asymptotic subgroup, then all asymptotic subgroups that are really commensurable to gamma one form finitely many commensurable classes. Next, remember the, uh, we defined uh, weak commensurability using semi simple elements. But in fact, weak commensurability can see the presence of unipotent elements. One proves that if two arithmetic groups are weakly commensurable, then the presence of a unipotent element in one of them is equivalent to the presence of a unipotent element in the other. And this, this has some implications, which I will mention in the next slide. And besides, we, uh, we have this arithmeticity theorem. So if you have a lattice, which is weakly commensurable to an asymptotic subgroup, then this, this lattice is also there. So all these results into one theorem. And again, you may wonder what happens if one has type BL and the other type has type CL. So I can tell you if you ask. And let, let me finish with geometric applications. Again, suppose we have uh, two uh, local geometric spaces, one arithmetically defined, and the other is just a local geometric space of finite volume. If these two local geometric spaces happen to be less commensurable, then the other one is also arithmetically defined. That tells you that uh, the length spectrum can actually see whether your space is arithmetically defined or not. Now, the application of the fact about important elements is that if one of the spaces is compact, the other is also compact. Telling you that, in fact, uh, the Next spectrum can see whether your space is, is compact or not. And we don't have a geometric reason for that. And we don't know, in fact, whether this equivalence is true if we drop the assumption that one of the spaces is In all cases, if you look at low placement spaces, uh, length commensurable to the fixed one. Then they break up into a union of finitely many classes. And if the ambient groups are not of one of those three types, then the spaces are actually always dimensional. And of course, you can interpret this theorem in your favorite concrete geometric situation. For example, here is what it tells us for hyperbolic. So suppose we have two arithmetically defined hyperbolic manifolds of the same dimension D, which is not three for obvious reasons, or, or uh, but it's also even or is three more four. So we exclude D equals one more four. Then if they are less commensurable, they're always commensurable. We can see a lot about the case where they have different dimensions. In fact, in this case, we can show that. They can never be that dimensional. And in fact, their length spectra are, are, are quite different. And also, that, the, for example, the complex hyperbolic manifold can never be length commensurable to. And so, and let me finish with our contribution to the Kevin here, the shape of, of the drum question. So, namely, all the compact as a spectrum of spaces. Uh, again, if one is expected defined, the other is expected defined. So the Laplace spectrum can also see whether your 
low prosthetic space is arithmetic controller. Now, this uh, two low prosthetic spaces have the same isometric field. And assuming that one of the spaces is arithmetic, we can prove that in case G is not of one of those three epsilon types, the space is R. And here's the list of problems. That's all I have. Thank you very much for your Yeah. Are there any questions? Shanyul theorem that in the function field setting, yeah, Shanyul is true. Oh, okay. it's true uh, what is your the functions function field setting if you might be able to avoid it? Elements which we need, so called generic elements, we have shown that they exist in plenty, but uh, the geometry, how it relates to. I mean, is there a concept of uh, the basic number of lengths? Yeah, so that needs the formula. It's quite remarkable that X is proved annually. Where he, of course, is looking at exponential and other. Function field uh, transcendence. Yeah, are there any questions for Gopal? <laughs> so let me congratulate Gopal. So, welcome everybody to the second session of the Gopal Prasad celebration. And we have Brian Conrad. Stanford University, who has had the pleasure of working with Gopal, and he will tell us about Gopal's work, more recent work. What you heard in the first half was mainly what Gopal had done to about 19, 2010, maybe. In the last years, he's been doing different things, including works with uh, Moy about representation theory that I don't know that you will cover it, but if not, I mentioned yeah, this opportunity. Thanks, for okay. Thanks very much. Uh, so it's an honor to be here. Um, so <clears throat> when I first got to Michigan, uh, bef well, before I arrived at Michigan, I kind of learned about algebraic groups from uh, reading Borel's book. And, you know, there's a difference between having a textbook understanding of something and really understanding something. And, <clears throat> and uh, I still remember there was a, a lecture course that Gopal gave on reductive groups uh, that I went to. And there were sort of two amazing things uh, in this course. So one was just, you know, how elegantly he explained many things and clarified a bunch of uh, stuff that I um, had not understood as well as I thought I did. Um, and the second thing was that he uh, never used any lecture notes. And so I kind of aspired to become better at the first part of, you know, understanding these things better. And I, I did over time, but <clears throat> um, so for the lecture notes part, I never quite got there. So that, that's a skill that's much harder to pick up. Um, yeah, well, depends how, how, how small one writes. <laughs> okay, so, um, so I'm going to talk. So the title I chose was Matrix Group Dynamics. And so what I want to talk about is, um, well, I'll first do some introductory discussion. And I want to eventually uh, focus on two aspects of Gopal's work in yeah, roughly the last uh, 15 years or so related to uh, pseudo-reductive groups and related to bruja titz theory. And there's a certain kind of dynamical theme uh, that shows up in both of these that uh, uh, Venkatesh briefly touched upon in his talk, and so I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, so uh, let me first say, uh, so just by way of introduction, so, so yeah, so one of the areas in which Gopal is a, is a real master um, is, is in this theory of reductive groups over general fields. And so in there we have, we have the classical types, so things like symplectic groups, uh, orthogonal groups, and so on. Uh, and then there are these uh, exceptional types. 
So things like G2 and so on. And then the richest thing, or you might call these kind of arithmetic variants. So special orthogonal groups of quadratic forms and so on. And, and one of the charming features of the theory is, of course, reinterpreting. Uh, you might have some problem about a quadratic space or some geometric object, and then reinterpret it in terms of some structural feature of one of these algebraic groups. And then these have a very rich, uh, rich structure theory. And so I just want to say that in the structure theory of reductive groups, so uh, two key features, and there are many key features of the, what makes the theory of reductive groups so beautiful, um, but two of them are, so one key thing is what you might call the, or what I'll call the SL2 crutch, which is the fact that inside of, for many questions about reductive groups, if you adjust the context where you're studying the problem, sometimes you can often reduce yourself, maybe ideally to some concrete computations with SL2 combined with some general theory. And in very uh, tangible terms, reductive groups, broadly speaking, tend to have lots of copies of SL2 inside of them. So for example, if you think about, let's say GL3, for instance, so inside of here, you'll have matrices, for example, with an SL2 in the upper left, and then a one, or you may have matrices with an SL2 in the corners, and then a one in the middle, the missing entries are all zero, or maybe, for example, maybe you'll have an SL2 in the lower right and a one in the upper left. Okay, so you have these different copies of SL2 sitting around, and the nice thing with SL2, aside from the fact that it's a small group, is that inside of SL2, you have these very concrete ways of describing most matrices in terms of a product of these three special types of matrices from these special one-dimensional groups. And so often, again, with appropriate technique, uh, some computations you may want to make may be able to be transferred to very concrete calculations with these very special types uh, of matrices. Uh, the other key tool that often gets used in developing the structure theory, a key feature, is the understanding of the parabolic subgroups. Okay, so, so inside of a reductive algebraic group, a parabolic subgroup will be a closed smooth subgroup with the property that when we form the coset space, which is always a quasi-projective variety, that this is actually projective. Okay, and so uh, a typical example of a parabolic subgroup, if we're working inside of some GLN, you might have one of these staircase kind of groups. So matrices that consist of entries above some staircase below the diagonal. And a typical parabolic, any parabolic subgroup of GLN is conjugate to one of this type. Okay, so in the study, and then for the other reductive groups, you can also describe them in fairly concrete terms. But in any event, these, these two features of reductive groups are among the uh, tools that are used in kind of understanding the structure theory. And let me just say, in terms of the output of the theory, and then we'll uh, shift to a different perspective. So, um, so, so two key, um, uh, let's say, outputs of the theory. And we'll come back to these later in modified settings. Uh, so one is that there's actually a, a kind of uniform approach. So even though in the classical setup, there are these matrix groups of these very different types, but there's really a kind of uniform approach to describing the, the kind of group theoretic structure. Okay, and this, this involves root systems and other types of things, but, but here maybe the slogan one might use is uh, no matrix calculations. So this I learned to appreciate from Gopal. You know, once, you know, once I asked him, I was like, oh God, with these exceptional groups, like do you, really have to work with these complicated Jordan algebras and G2 and whatever. He's like, oh, no, 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 never, never do that. It's like, okay. Um, so, so there's a kind of uniform way to, uh, to think about these things, which is 
very, very powerful. Uh, and at the same time, uh, and maybe one could say it's kind of the charm of the subject, is at the same time, there's also a kind of classification which is sensitive to the particular field over which one is working. So there's a sort of, so classification of all possibilities, roughly speaking. Okay, and um, so that's the situation for, uh, for reductive groups, but in the topics that I'm gonna be coming to with these pseudo-reductive groups and in, in Borel-Titz theory, in Borel-Titz theory, um, one doesn't have these, these two kind of technical devices that underlie things in some sense disappear. So, so, so for the work that Gopal did on uh, pseudo-reductive groups, Uh, and, and in Bruja Titz theory, uh, both the SL2 crutch and um, let's say the role of parabolic subgroups uh, in some sense disappear. I mean, of course, the notion the notion of parabolic subgroup makes sense quite generally, even if the group is not reductive. Um, but the point is that the, uh, the, 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 the important role of parabolic subgroups in the reductive structure theory sort of is not really, um, is not played by parabolic subgroups. So, so these two tools that one is very accustomed to from experience in the reductive case, they will no longer be available. And we're gonna need some completely different viewpoint uh, to, make analogs of the reductive theory in other situations. So what's gonna replace them? And so that's gonna take us to uh, dynamics. So let me just highlight, so in this notion of parabolic subgroup, there's, uh, there's this geometric definition. There's a property of the coset space that G mod P is projective. Well, it turns out, as I'll now explain, there's a, a way to kind of carve out interesting subgroups by a kind of dynamical process. And when it's applied in the reductive case, we will recover the notion of parabolicity, but from a completely different point of view that does not use geometry in quite the same sense that's being used here. So let me start with an actual computation. So let's consider a map from GL1 to GL4. So I'll send T to, uh, let's see here, T squared, T squared, T to the minus one, T to the minus three, and all the other entries are zero. Okay, so this is, this is a diagonal matrix. And, um, and if I give you some four by four matrix G, and I conjugate it by these diagonal matrices, let me tell you what I get. So I'll define the action of T on G to be given by conjugation against this one, this, we'll call this a one parameter subgroup of G, this map. And let me just tell you how it comes out. Uh, let's see. So in the upper left, nothing changes. Here, nothing changes, Here, nothing changes. And then we get some powers of T. So here we get a T cubed. And, oops, sorry, that's a T to the fifth. Here we get a T cubed. And here we get T to the minus three. So I did these calculations on the plane last night, but I think it's correct. And here we get a T to the minus five. and a T to the minus two. Okay, so the main thing I wanna highlight, ooh. So here, right? So here we see the exponents are all negative, right? Those are the places with the negative exponents. Okay, and so, so the question I wanna raise is the following, which is, well, first, let me say this a bit informally. So when does the limit, as t goes to zero, or sorry. So for which g, uh, 
there is the limit as t goes to zero of t acting on g exist. Okay, so of course I have to define what that means, right? So of course this is a purely algebraic setting. So what do I mean by limit? Well, informally, what you would like to say is basically, when does this actually make sense to evaluate at t equals zero? But let me say this in more precise terms. So we have this kind of orbit map, t goes to t acting on g for a given g. GL1 sits inside the affine line as the complement of the origin. And you could ask that this map extends to a map from the affine line. So basically what it's asking is the appearance of T in there should be as a polynomial. And so then we see that necessary and sufficient condition in this case should be that all of those AIJ entries uh, inside the yellow region should all be zero. Okay, so we need where the AIJs are zero uh, inside, inside the yellow region. Okay, well, but what does that, what does that leave? Right, so if we make that as our, well, let's make that as our kind of definition. So PG of lambda will define to be the, the points of G, you know, appropriate functorially if you want to be rigorous, which you should be. Um, but so the points of G with the property that this orbit map actually extends across to the affine line. Okay, so that's going to be your definition. And in this particular example, this comes out to be exactly the things which are the, scare, the staircase type where you have the zero, zero here and a zero here and otherwise you get that, okay? So this dynamical condition that the orbit under this diagonal subgroup should have an extension across the origin to a map from the affine line exactly cuts out a parabolic subgroup, okay? Now th this, I mean, this, this way of interpreting parabolics in the reductive case, uh, of course, goes back a long way. Um, but the thing I just want to stress is it can be shown that for any reductive G, as you vary through all the one parameter subgroups of that G, that this gives you exactly the parabolic subgroup. So it's a fact that in the reductive case, this gives exactly this process as you vary the lambda this gives exactly the parabolic subgroups. Okay. But the point is that, of course, this, this definition makes perfectly good sense quite generally, and uh, as I'll comment in a moment, but it does not mention anything about the properties of G mod P, right? It's just, a, it's just some kind of dynamical condition, and there's no, it's, not, it's not really a geometric definition. Okay. So, so on the one hand, right? sorry? Um, uh, probably, yeah, I don't know the history, but yeah. So this, this notion goes back a long way over a few, absolutely. So let me make two other, point out two other constructions and then tell you the aspect which makes this interesting for purposes coming later. Yeah, so, so the fact that this gives all parabolic subgroups goes back a long time. Um, so there, here are two other constructions. So UG lambda, so these are going to be the points with the property that the limit not only exists, but is trivial, okay? Well, the way that, the way that you make, these are all zero, and when you set T equal to zero, these all disappear, right? And so then you need parts of the identity matrix here, here, and there. So in that example, you would get exactly groups of this type with an identity matrix of one to one, and then zeros here, and then stuff like this, okay? And, and this thing here, this is the unipotent radical of that PG lambda, okay? Meaning this is the largest smooth connected closed subgroup, all of whose points are unipotent. And the, the key thing I just want to emphasize is that this definition does not mention the word unipotent anywhere, right? It's just a dynamical condition, but it so happens that again, if you're working in reductive groups over fields, these kinds of groups will always give you exactly unipotent radicals of parabolic subgroups. Great. And let me make one last definition. 
And then I'll tell you a theorem that <coughs> is not in Kempf. Um, so you can define ZG. So we have the pieces where the, the, the dynamics has a limiting value. The limiting value is one. And then the, the opposite extreme is where the action does nothing. You centralize the action. So the points in G where the effect of the diagonal is just G itself. Okay. And in the running example, this is exactly this is exactly matrices that are a GL2 and then a no, some non-zero thing along the rest of the diagonal. Okay. Great. So, so now I'd like to tell you uh, a theorem about these things that holds far beyond the reductive setting, even over rings, and it will be very fundamental in all that will follow. But the thing I just want to stress, the thing I just want to stress is that there's no, uh, there's not really a geometry in these definitions, it's some dynamical construction. Okay, so here's the, the theorem. So let's suppose, so this is, and so Gopal and I, when we developed this, we did this work on pseudo-reductive groups. So this began in the, the last year that Gopal and I were colleagues at Michigan. And uh, we started talking about these things. And then we had these email exchanges with Ofer Gaber. And the way things would usually go is we would work on some stuff for a while. You know, we would get stuck somewhere. We would write to Ofer. He would send us this cryptic email. And sometimes it would make no sense and we would just go on. Other times you get some germ of something. We'd go on and maybe like six months later realize that, oh, maybe this is what Ofer meant there or there. Some of the stuff we still never figured out. But anyway, uh, another important lesson I learned from Gopal is the importance of deadlines. So when we were writing this book, he said, we're going to dedicate this to Tits for his 80th birthday. And this has a very powerful uh, motivating effect because you can't punt somebody's 80th birthday the next year. Right, it has to get done in time. So it was a very stressful Christmas vacation one year, but it got done in time. So deadlines are very effective. So here's the theorem. So, so let G be uh, any uh, smooth affine group over any ring K. Uh, and uh, pick any homomorphism from GL1 to G. Okay, and these definitions, functorially interpreted, all make perfectly good sense in this generality. There's nothing about reductive groups or fields here. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And so, so first of all, these preceding constructions, so the above three constructions, uh, make good sense. Uh, as smooth closed subgroups. G. Uh, secondly, that this UG lambda semi-direct is ZG is equal to PG. The more serious ones is that, well, if instead of the lambda, you use the reciprocal of lambda, basically compose T with one over T, you'd flip to kind of the opposite unipotent subgroup on the other side of the diagonal. And the statement is that if you consider the reciprocal one parameter subgroup together with the ZG and the U, and you multiply them together to G, this is always an open immersion. All right, you might call this a kind of open cell uh, without an SL2, without the SL2 crutch. So I, I described a kind of generic element of SL2 as a product of three types of matrices. And this is a kind of big open piece of G that you always have available, uh, even in this broader setting with smooth affine groups. And the proofs of these have nothing to do with the structure theory of reductive groups at all. There's no SL2s hiding in the picture or anything. Um, and then the last thing is that uh, if K is a field, then uh, 
let me just say UG lambda uh, has all points unipotent. Uh, and um, let me just say has a uh, tangible product structure. Okay, so I won't state it precisely here, but the point is that this group can be written as a product of very specific types of uh, subgroups governed by certain weights of, of the GL1 action on the Lie algebra, okay? So in, in quite broad generality, the feature that you're working over rings will be very important in the bruja tits work, but the fact that you, this holds for any smooth affine group and has nothing to do with the reductive structure theory at all, as an a priori input into any study, turn out to be extremely useful. As I say, in the reductive theory, these features are very familiar, but they're often understood as a consequence of the development of the general structure theory, which uses lots of SL2 calculations and so forth, but, but none of that is needed. Uh, let me just make two little remarks on this, and then I'll turn to the main uh, focus of from Gopal's work. So one remark is that the notion of, you see, the notion of a torus has a good analog over any ring, but as far as I'm aware, unless maybe Pierre knows something I don't, uh, over rings is not really a good notion of a unipotent group. Is that correct? Okay, good. And, um, but the UG lambdas always make sense. They're always available. And over fields, they have unipotent, they're, they're unipotent groups in the usual sense, but I'll just say, so there's no notion of, there's no good notion of unipotent group over rings, but these UG lambdas always make sense. So they're kind of a, a good substitute for various purposes. You don't have to develop it to just work with these things. I'll have many features that you would like. And the, uh, the other thing is that beyond the reductive group setting, the notion of parabolic and the notion of um, uh, PG lambda diverge. So beyond reductive groups, so as I said, in the reductive setting, this PG, I mean, it's not obvious. In the reductive setting, the PG lambda construction happens to coincide with exactly the parabolic subgroups. But beyond the reductive setting, these concepts turn out to be diff very different from each other. So beyond reductive groups, the notions of PG lambda, and of parabolicity in the sense of this geometric definition of G mod P being a projective variety, uh, these diverge. These are very different notions. Now you might hope, or I hoped, that maybe we could character, so when we were developing, and uh, I'll turn now to the, the theory of pseudo-reductive groups, so let me just say at the outset that these PG lambdas will play a very important role. And at the beginning, I was really annoyed by working with these very concretely defined things, like there's gotta be a, a geometric definition, some finer notion for G mod P beyond the reductive setting that would replace it. And there is a candidate, didn't, we couldn't quite prove, I couldn't prove that it characterized anything and much later found that in fact it was just always wrong. So the upshot is that there is no, there's no, there's no geometric definition of this. I mean, we have this dynamic notion but I'll just say that there's, there's a guess that one might make, um, and I can discuss it afterwards if anybody's interested, but uh, it doesn't work. So, so that's a real problem. Well, it seems like it could be a real problem. So, so anyway, these concepts really diverge. And so it's a kind of testament to Gopal's insight. So, um, so Gopal kind of emphasized that, um, so noted uh, that we should focus, focus on these PG lambdas and not on parabolicity uh, beyond the reductive case. I mean, in an appropriate sense. I mean, of course, the notion of parabolic subgroup is very useful in the general setting for setting up the general theory of algebraic groups. But I'm just saying that for the finer things that now I'll be turning to, the, the, the role filled by parabolic subgroups will be filled by these dynamically defined PG lambdas. And as I say, I tried for a while to I was just, I didn't really believe him, but, but he was correct, <clears throat> as I'll now discuss. Okay, so now let me turn to these 
pseudo-reductive groups. So, so now we have these dynamic constructions that if I give you a map from GL1, that you can make these interesting subgroups. And as I, I just want to emphasize again, just because it's maybe a bit surprising that the reductive groups have not, they're not hiding in the proofs of this, right? There's no, you know, there's no bait and switch here, okay? This is just some general, of course, one has to prove this somehow, but, but, but regardless, this, this is really gives one a kind of different approach to setting up the theory of reductive groups over fields, not having to start over the algebraic closure and pull everything down, but starting at the, over your field and working your way up. So now let me turn to, so these two features of Gopal's work in more recent years, so pseudo-reductive groups and bruja titz theory. So these are both kind of refinements of the theory of reductive groups in two very different ways. So if we think about fields of positive characteristic, um, in loosely speaking, most fields of positive characteristic are not perfect fields which means that Galois theory is not available to analyze problems over the field by working over the algebraic closure, okay? So, so this is a kind of joint work uh, with Gopal and Ofer Gaber. So the starting point is, so if, if you're working over a field of positive characteristic, then um, how to say that there are uh, well, there's a natural generalization of reductivity that people had not really looked at. And so let me just briefly tell you what the definition is, and then I'll, I'll sort of tell you what the main points are of what what was obtained and how, how it really relies on these dynamical things. So in a reductive group, again, there are the classical examples that are very useful for orienting yourself, but there's a general definition, which is that over, so, so, so reductive is the condition that over the algebraic closure, whoops, uh-oh, over the algebraic closure, the unipotent radical is trivial. There's no non-trivial, smooth connected unipotent normal subgroup, okay? Uh, for pseudo-reductive, the definition is that you look for smooth connected unipotent normal subgroups defined over K and that there should be none of those other than the trivial group, okay? So that's your definition. And the point is that if you're studying a question involving a somewhat abstractly defined smooth algebraic group, maybe it's built by a Zariski closure process, you don't know too much about it, that you can often very quickly reduce your study to the pseudo-reductive case. But if your field is not perfect, these notions are very different from each other. And so there's some interest in trying to push through for the theory of reductive groups and make an analog. This is, it turns out, over fields of positive characteristic that are not perfect, this is a much, much larger class of groups. And one might try to see if we can take the very rich structure theory in the reductive setting and establish some analogs here, okay? And Borel and Titz tried to do this in the 1970s, but they got stuck. Um, so Borel and Titz, uh, in around 1978 or so, uh, they tried to um, sort of develop, or to let me just say adapt uh, reductive theorems to the pseudo-reductive case. Okay, but they were not able to get very far. And although we didn't know too much about what they had tried to do until we had been thinking about it for a while, um, but one of the main tools that they were missing was to, well, they, they thought a little bit about this dynamical stuff, but roughly speaking, they weren't using schemes, so that made some things a bit harder. Um, and they were also missing some basic constructions that would inform how to think about the possibilities that may exist. So, so let me just tell you what the, what the main results were that we obtained on this, or a sense of the main results. First of all, it turns out that most most pseudo-reductive groups arise 
from, from what we call the standard construction, a standard construction. which uses two ingredients. It uses some reductive groups over finite extensions. And it uses some, you might call auxiliary commutative data. Okay, so very roughly speaking, there's a certain class of examples that goes way beyond the reductive setting, which have the feature that they can kind of be understood as a combination of what you know about the reductive theory over finite extensions and what you understand about smooth commutative groups over your field. Okay, so there's this standard construction. And then the real theorem is that most of the uh, most examples that exist can be shown to arise in the standard form. Okay, so that's one of the main results, but there are exceptions. And what do you do about the exceptions? And so this is again a place where uh, kind of Gopal's mastery of, uh, of Lie theory kind of saved the day. So I'll just say the exceptions can be, um, how to put it, concretely described. And, and it's really the case that like, when we, we knew that there were these situations that you know, might not fall completely inside of this and you know, Gopal knows about F4 and G2 and all these things like his back, the back of his hand. And so <clears throat> that was a kind of, and you know, everything about the exceptional Lie types. And so we were able to kind of harness that and give very concrete descriptions of pretty much all of the exceptional cases. And yet at the same time, despite, despite the fact that there's this kind of dichotomy in the concrete descriptions, there's still nonetheless a kind of uniform, uniform structure theory and classification. So I'll just say a kind of uniform structure theory. But if you try to copy the proofs that you use in the reductive setting, none of them carry over because roughly speaking, there are no SL2s floating around. Even if you go up to suitable, you know, separable field extensions, I mean, there's no, you can't find any SL2s and after the fact, they're not there in, in the way that you would hope. And so the question is, what do you do? And the answer is you use this, this theorem as the starting point. So I'll just say these kind of, uh, the sort of general, you know, P lambda, U lambda, and Z lambda uh, circumvent, circumvent the kind of missing tools. Uh, from the classical theory. Okay, so, so that works out very, very nicely. Okay, so what about, so I mean, of course, I mean, there are many technical details, but the point is that you have the reductive theory for the maximal reductive quotient of the algebraic closure, but over the original field, you can't really exploit that. And so the fact that these dynamic constructions allow you to kind of carve out interesting subgroups whose properties you can kind of get a handle on gives you some tool to make computations to eventually put your group into the standard form or to show that if it's not in the standard form to understand why that fails and to show that it fits into one of some finite list of exceptional constructions. <laughs> okay. Uh, so what about Bruja Tits theory? So, so as I say, so here the main point is just that you have these groups that in the end have features like the reductive case, but the role of parabolicity has to be replaced by these P of lambdas. So in the Bruja, but you're still always working over a field, okay? Um, in the case of bruja tits theory, so now we're gonna take K, just say for concreteness to be a piatic field. So it might be, so K has its, its ring of integers and some finite residue field you can think concretely about QP containing ZP mapping onto FP. And what you would like is, um, so now G of K, G is now a reductive group. So connected reductive over K. And G of K now, K has its valuation topology. It's a locally compact field. G of K is sort of like a, non-Archimedean counterpart to a Lie group. And so this has a locally compact topology. <clears throat> uh, 
And, um, and so one might want to understand, you know, what can we say about um, its, you know, compact subgroups or maximal compact subgroups? What can we understand about the representation theory of this? And so let me just say, so Bruja Titz theory, as it was originally developed by Bruja and Titz, um, this gives, uh, so two, well, two main outputs, I mean, it has many applications, but the kind of two main things that it provides are, first it provides this thing called the building. I'll call that B of G. And so this is a metric space, which has an action by G of K by isometries on it. And if you look at stabilizers of certain subsets of this metric space, they carve out interesting subgroups. And so I'll just say you get this building with this action um, that helps one to organize and think about the maximal compact subgroups of which there can be multiple, many conjugacy classes. So maximal compact subgroups and certain interesting finite index subgroups of those. So for example, these Moy-Prasad filtrations that Sarnak was alluding to are examples of certain interesting uh, subgroups that one carves out. So there's this geometric object that they build by a very complicated process. And by thinking about the action on there, you can kind of cut out these interesting subgroups and study, study their properties. Um, and this, is, this, is, this has many applications in representation theory, the G of K, for example. Um, and the second thing that, that the theory gives you is a kind of geometric, uh, uh, a way to describe some of these interesting compact subgroups in terms of integral structures on G. So it gives you integral models. I'll say script G over O for your group G that begins life over K uh, with the property that among other things, if you take its group of integral points inside the rational points that this yields many, not all, but many of the uh, compact subgroups that show up in one. So this uh, yields many of the subgroups uh, in one. Um, and then the, the, the point being that you can try to use the algebraic geometry of script G to understand features of G of O, okay? And study, so use structural properties of G to understand or describe properties of G of O. Okay, so that's what Bruja Titz theory gives one. But there's a big problem. Well, the problem is that the, you know, the development of the theory is extraordinarily complicated. They use many, many, uh, and those guys are masters of complicated group theoretic computations, okay? So, so in the original paper, there were many laborious computations. And so even if the output of a theory could be stated in a somewhat succinct way with a bit of note, with, you know, some notation, but to actually understand where the theory comes from and why it works involve these very, very laborious computations. And so in the approach, oh, oh I'm sorry, I forgot to, yes. Yeah, so this is, ah, so th this, is, this is joint in his, his book with, uh, with Tasha Kalefa. So, so, so in the Kalefa Prasad approach to Bruja Titz theory, they got rid of, or they essentially eliminated the need for the very, very laborious computations. So they use a lot more algebraic geometry uh, over the ring, O, to remove the dependence, remove the need. I mean, of course, then you could, complain that you've shifted it to having to learn about algebraic geometry over rings, but that's worth doing anyway. Um, so, so remove the need for the laborious computation because it's good for other stuff, you see. And, and in doing this, um, what are some of the key tools? Well, I'll just briefly tell you two. So one thing is that so these integral models, you, you start by putting your group inside a GLN and in certain situations, certain Zariski closure procedures give rise to these integral models. Other cases, you have to massage them in some way. 
But suffice to say, they build certain kinds of integral models, and the way they get their hands on them to avoid these tedious computations is you use the fact that there's these dynamic open cell. So by using this kind of dynamical procedure over the DVR, inside of the integral model, they can immediately carve out this u plus and this u minus and this z, where the u plus minus have a concrete product structure as well, where these things are fairly tangible. Or can be, you can move yourself to situations where they are tangible and you can make computations. Okay, so that's, well, and that's one and that's two. So the point is that these dynamic procedures give you a, a way to kind of dig your hands into the structure of these integral models. And, and then more importantly, or just as importantly, you can actually use the geometric understanding of these things to actually get a handle on the failure of reductivity of the reduction. So you can use this, use these kind of dynamic things over O to sort of study, study the reduction, like what is its unipotent radical? What's the root system of the reductive quotient? By reducing problems, or you might say lifting problems, lifting pro whoa, lifting problems to, to the integral model and then passing to G over the field. So the point is that you have this integral model whose structure is very mysterious, but what matters is it's smooth. We don't know anything else about it, but it's smooth. Therefore, that general open cell construction really is applicable. And these things I say in quite general settings have a kind of product description. If you understand the nature of the weights on the integral Lie algebra, which you can read off from the weights on the generic fiber. And so the point is that you can use these concrete things inside to take certain questions, relate them to structural problems at the level of O, and then pass to the generic fiber, which is a reductive group, and then solve your problem. So, I mean, of course, it's obviously, I mean, as, as Sarnak mentioned, this is a, what is it, 800 page book, right? So of course, it's still a lot of work, but things become much more conceptual, okay? And so the complicated calculations disappear. And so these integral models and the fact that you can dig out interesting pieces of them a priori allows you to eliminate the need for many of the tedious group theoretic calculations. So then in the end, one feels like the theory is working for a kind of understandable reason. All right, so I'll stop there. Zoom? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, not from here. I, <laughs> anyway, I'm happy to take questions from anywhere. It's not from Twitter. Yeah. Yes. Right. So what you have to. Sorry, yes. So, so the, que the question is, what's really going on in these product decompositions? And so the general statement, which is, is the real content is over a field, which is that when you have your GL1 action and you look at the set of weights, if you break up the set, if you can decompose the set of weights as a disjoint union where the semi-group generated by each of the sets are pairwise disjoint, then the group breaks up as a product where all the weights of that piece live in that factor. Yeah, so the A and the 2A do not get separated in this way, which of course they can't. Yeah. Can you recover the whole row at this uh, Well, Gopal does. I mean, first of all, I'm, again, I mean, th this is a talk for a general audience and I'm just talking for 10 minutes. But yeah, you, you do recover everything in row theory, right? Yeah. Over the discreetly valued fields. No, I, yeah. I, you said that row theory has two parts. The first is done over maximal unramified action where the group is either split or quasi-split. And then the structure of the group is simple. 
and you can give evaluation to the root groups. But in what is the second step is to descend from maximal unramified extension to the base field. And that takes quite a bit of time, uh, whereas the approach we have, uh, there the uh, descent is done <coughs> totally using group schemes and the geometry of building over maximal unramified extension. So in that sense, it simplifies the descent part of it. Yeah, I mean, and, like an, an analog, an analogy to that would be like most treatments of the theory of reductive groups start by developing a theory over algebraically closed fields and then refining it. But if you use this dynamic stuff, you can avoid that. You can develop everything directly over the ground field and then, you know, prove things by going up, but the definition, the construction start at the bottom. In fact, yes, we agree. Uh, Brian had an article which simplified a large part of his year three. Yeah, and some of the tedious parts can be yeah, settled this way. So it's, it's very useful for making certain constructions directly downstairs. And then you have to analyze their properties, but maybe certain constructions just obtain more directly this way. Money out of this book. <laughs> because you sent me and it said, do not circulate. Oh. <laughs> you can circulate a monkey. You know, it's not to be circulated because there may be errors which we are not. <laughs> All right, so uh, you can uh, email me and I'll, <laughs> yes. I'll, I'll charge you. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, in fact, I will give you a print copy. <laughs> Yes. yes. So if you have over a local field of characteristic P, yes. does everything work for Yeah, P? yeah. I always said piatic for, for no particular reason. Henselian discreetly valued with perfect residue field. Yeah. Yeah, Henselian field will be enough. Discreetly valued. Yeah. yeah. So can you also do it? Horizontal uh, reduction in the system uh, when we are in that moment? I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, I can't understand sorry. what you're saying. Can you do parabolic induction regression using distance three and C and U and V? Yeah, you know, but uh, it, one is working with reductive groups where PG lambda becomes a parabolic subgroup. I'm sure. So, right. so uh, you know, to, to have compact induction, parabolic induction, all that is available, but that was already available before this theory. Uh, was done, but on the other hand, now they have construction of, uh, you know, um, various representations which use all the induction and so-called more precise and so on. So it's all done in the Any questions from the void? Uh, okay. All right, let's thank Brian for one.